Good evening. Um, I'm Carrie Ivers with the Town of Penfield, and tonight we are having our second Clark Road Barn Advisory Committee meeting. Um, I will uh, we'll start the meeting by going around with introductions, and I've already started that, so I will pass it over to my neighbor. And if you want to have just everybody speak into the mic, otherwise I'll get a little, Tyler will talk from uh, behind the green curtain and tell us to speak into a mic. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm Caitlin Mivas. I'm the Director of Preservation at the Landmark Society of Western New York. Uh, for those not familiar, we're the regional nonprofit historic preservation organization. I'm Mike Heath, uh, Penfield Town resident. I'm Tom Combs. I'm a longtime Penfield resident, and uh, I chair the uh, Penfield Historic Preservation Board. My name is Shannon Barg. I'm a building inspector here at the Town of Penfield, and I'm the liaison to the Historic Preservation Board. Uh, Matt Prinzing, junior planner with the Town of Penfield. Amy Owens, engineering department, Town of Penfield. Uh, Tim Masterton, parks department, Penfield. I'm Mindy McLaren, I'm a Penfield resident. Uh, I'm Sarah Hall, I'm an architectural designer with some experience with preserving historic barns. Mike Matthews, Penfield citizen. Excellent. So I'm gonna maybe start off and say that um, we're really happy to have Sarah and Caitlin here. They're sort of our, what we would call subject matter experts in the field of historic preservation and we thought this was an important um, area of expertise to have represented. Um, I think Sarah and Caitlin won't be at every meeting, but we'll have them maybe invite them to key meetings to provide feedback and input. And this felt like the, a really good time to have them join us at the meeting. So we thank you for being here. Um, it's you know really helpful and, and the town appreciates um, your expertise. So with that, I thought the, the, the three things we're trying to accomplish tonight or that we're gonna go over at this meeting would be, um, I would like to do a quick run through or review of the 3D model um, and go through that together as a group. I think um, because we're gonna be broadcasting on the screen, it will be also be captured potentially um, as part of the broadcast. I will confirm that with PCTV. I hope I'm saying something that's true. Um, so I thought that would be helpful. I will share with you that we didn't want to post this um, this uh, 3D rendering or model in advance of tonight's meeting, but it will be added to the town's website after tonight's meeting. Um, so the next day or two, if you went on to the Clark Road Barn Advisory Committee page on the town's website, a link to this with instructions will be there. Um, I don't want to promise it's happening first thing tomorrow, so I'll say next couple of days. Um, so I'm gonna start there and then after we have a, a quick sort of tour, if you will, virtual as it may be, um, then I would like to take a look at the refined list of um, quite, um, excuse me, um, alternatives. We, we took the uh, sort of draft alternatives that were discussed at meeting number one based on the comments that we heard in terms of expanding some of those. We did um, modify the alternatives uh, list, so I'd like to get some feedback on that and maybe hope to finalize that alternatives um, menu, if you will. And then the other thing we heard after reviewing some potential evaluation criteria that could be used is developing a rubric. And so we took the liberty of drafting one just to be a point of discussion. I think it's always easier to read things review things and then comment versus trying to create them from scratch as a committee. We would be here until next summer just with that process. So it's always easier and faster to respond to something. So I think without any further ado, I'm going to hit play. At any point, we can pause this, we can zoom in, we can look up, we can look down, we can go down to the basement, we can go up to the loft if the loft area is above us. So this is a time not to be shy. This is pretend we're walking through a building together, the, the building together, and you're like, oh no, wait, Carrie, can I go look over here? Um, so we, let's don't be shy about stopping me and asking to see something. And just uh, for clarity, the the imagery that you're seeing was shot initially in May of this year, so May 24th, if I'm going to pick a date out of memory, if I'm not mistaken. Some of the images and st shots that were um, taken were uh, 
updated, some angles were updated um, in, in based on new footage that was collected in June. Um, also important to note that the, the imagery was um, collected through a combination of drone camera work and then cameras that were on pole extensions because there are portions of the building that you are not able to walk onto or under potentially for, for safety reasons. So I don't want people to think that somebody was walking around with a camera here. This was all done either through drone or through pole extensions with cameras attached to them. And I say cameras, it might have been video. I have no idea the, the actual technology. And also, as we're going through, does anybody want to stop? I'm doing a lot of talking. I'm going to stop. Does anybody want to stop and see anything? We can always go back and we can always go down, but we'll just do this sort of, sort of little walkthrough. So the tarp would be on this roof at this time? It the was not. It was not, I don't think. I, uh, the fir one of the first images when you went in, there was no tarp on the roof. Yeah, because I think that happened the week after yes. this was shot. It was? was. Tyler? Yes. Oh, David. Oh. Oh, the tarp okay. was on when you sh Oh, okay. My mistake. Okay. All right, thank you. Is the tarp... Oh, thank you. So the tarp is like... Oh, mm -hmm. I'm expecting to see blue. <laughs> Okay, all okay. right, thank you for the clarification. That's Dave Renner. And so uh, Dave was the person I copied in on the email. I circulated everyone when we sent this so that if you had technical questions, he is the person to ask because if you ask me, I'm only gonna ask him. The other thing I'm going to share is that on the walls and in some of the columns, you're going to see sort of gray, blackish looking smudge marks. That is, um, those are images and words that had to be blurred out because they are not safe for public consumption or appropriate for public consumption. So I just want people to think that we weren't like trying to hot like, so when you're seeing that, there's things there that we shouldn't be looking at together at a town hall. Dave, I don't know if you can still hear me, but we have to work on adding music to this. <laughs> I just feel like it's so so quiet. <laughs> um, internally, this footage was shared with Department of Engineering and the Building Department, um, and so there's a few folks in in town hall who are wondering if there are ghosts inside. <laughs> <laughs> so that we're not going to be including that as part of our analysis of the building. Tim, I don't know if you know the answer to this question. Is there currently electrical to the barn? No, the electric was cut off. It was? Yes. Okay. Were there other utilities, sewer connected to the building at all? Not that I am aware of. I don't, I don't believe there are, but we can, we can certainly yeah. confirm that.
So I guess hand in hand with that is any water hookup ever? Um, again, not not that I'm aware of. That's something we'd have to look up. There's a sink down there, but I don't know if that was hooked up in the basement. Yeah, there is a just, sink. You know, but, in terms uh, of if there's water, do something up. with this if you have to put all those you know infrastructure in, or do they already exist? Just back there. Yeah, I believe, I think so. I would want to. So if you stop the deer for a second. Yeah. It looks like they've, somebody's put some kind of reinforcing beams. I don't know what the right term would be is two by sixes or something to reinforce that area. So any of that kind of construction or salvaging kind of work was done before the town owned it? town mm -hmm. has not done anything no so when you're looking at the looking at like that the, board right there is not a, a beam it's this a, yeah yeah that was the the town um this would have predated the town's possession of it and including i think there's some it looks like metal um supports and then the cinder block and i think um, you've answered the question once the town has possession of this you haven't the town hasn't done anything to it any kind of upgrades Secu yeah yeah secure like stuff. secured it yeah. to um try to prevent entry yeah. so this to is, the building this is the state in which you purchased it yeah and i was with, with yeah, added deterioration the, yeah wow. there's there's i think there's photo documentation of the building when the town obtained it when um i am aware that the buildings on the property were part of the purchase of the land Mm -hmm. the that wasn't an option for the town to not right. take over the because 1960 is its own parcel and it's not included in the bond bonded portion of the of the purchase of property um uh, and i don't know that the town had the ability to inspect it prior to owning it i think they were able to do an inspection once they got it but i don't think they were able to inspect it before they took possession i would certainly have to check that because that all predates me Gary, before you scoot away from there, yeah. it's a question for barn experts. Um, the the steel the steel supports uh, are clearly not newish. Uh, do you know when those might have been historically added to a building like this? I've never seen that in a really old barn. And then the the cinder blocks are the same thing. They're not a standard size, so at some point somebody was shoring up the structure a long time ago. Yeah, no, I don't think that there's any way to really know, but yeah, I mean, they definitely have been there for a while. I mean, it's just like, I think any, um, you know, you go into any older house, basement, people will, you know, added those over time. Well, sure, um, but these are clearly old and they don't yeah. seem to be next to a wooden, a wooden support. So yeah, so, like you know, original. my guess is, you know, owners over time, we're seeing some kind of evidence of settling or shifting, and we're trying to correct for that. But, yeah. That's so the it does, it, they don't help you age the building then? Mm -mm, no. We'll go. I will, I'll check historical records. I thought I checked quickly, but to the extent that this work would have could have been performed without the benefit of a building permit, so the town wouldn't have an, a record of age of or when it was performed. So we can, but we can certainly double check that. Are there any things that stand out as unique or interesting or something special about the barn versus other ones that you're familiar with of this type? Um, from my perspective, 
I wouldn't, there's, I have not, nothing's jumped out at me as particularly unique. That's not to say that it's not, you know, important. We're just for everybody, we're up on, we are in, up in the loft area now. Just for everybody to know where you are in the building. And just as a um, point of clarification, the, I know even though there are stairs that we can see, they are not usable stairs. A ladder needed to be utilized to obtain sort of access up to that spot. My question, would a loft have been part of the original construction or is that something that's often an add-on in barns like this? I, that was a question that I think somebody had raised just based on the material that was used. And I don't know if that's something that can be determined or not and whether it matters or not, to be honest with you. But just out of curiosity, is that something we sort of see, see it normally or is that something that's like added on typically? I mean, most barns have historically some kind of hay mow. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Does everybody feel like they've seen what they need? Like, and again, we all have access to this electronically. If you want to zoom in and play, and everybody, the one thing I will point out, and I think it was provided in the, is anytime you see one of these little green, did everybody realize that when you see these little green pinpoints that there's a photo mm -hmm. that you can click on and enlarge? Okay. Um, all right, so I think if, um, if everybody feels comfortable with the, the sort of the virtual tour, I think it might be beneficial to take a look at the um, the alternatives and find out whether or not we need to make any tweaks, changes, additions. I think I want to be somewhat mindful of you know sort of keeping a manageable list of. Zoom right in. So a couple of things. Um, you'll see the first two haven't changed from what was originally presented at the last meeting, that the town would re rebuild, re rehabilitate the structure's exterior, foundation, and interior to be used as conditioned occupiable space. All requirements for public assembly and enclosed permanent structure would be met. Restrooms, energy code requirements, et cetera, whatever that laundry list is. Uh, t the other option or next alternative was town restores the structure's exterior foundation and rehabilitates the interior to be used on a temporary or seasonal basis. And I'm just provide we provided sort of examples of what that might look like or could be and it we put in a farmer's market space as an example. But certainly not the only temporary or seasonal. Item C, and you'll notice I'm not putting these in numbered order because sometimes numbers denote some sense of like you know, preference or order, and I'm trying to be real careful about not doing that. Um, town restores the structure's exterior and foundation to ensure safety with no occupancy of the building permitted. Um, the next on the list, and this is where we start to, we fleshed out a couple of the alternatives to sort of s differentiate what might happen with the, the barn structure and or the property. So town relocates and restores the barn on a different town property. 
as, a, as an alternative private party or external organization relocates and restores the barn on a non-town property because before we had sort of just relocation of the barn structure without differentiating those two. Um, the other option we had was town subdivides the parcel and issues an RFP for the transfer of the barn and portion of the property immediately surrounding the parcel, meaning that portion around just south of Clark Road. Um, because this is a port, even though this parcel, even though it's split by Clark Road, it's one of the old parcels that has a road running through it. Monroe County real property doesn't let that happen anymore. Um, but this is an example of one that exists and predates current standards for real property and subdivision. Um, so it would be just portioning off that one piece at south. Um, and then, in, and so that would be an RFP. And we can talk about whether or not that RFP would dictate the need for restoration. And, and I think that was the sort of the under, that was the inf inference, but it wasn't stated outright. So if that's something that we would want to capture as part of the alternative, we would want to make that change. Then we have um, some uh, demolition and salvaging options, careful demolition of the current structure with salvage beams and other building materials repurposed on other town projects or off-site, careful demolition of the current structure with salvage materials sold and or donated to a third-party user. And then the final alternative would be standard demolition with no materials salvaged. So do we miss, based on our last meeting, do we miss anything um, for what we should be looking at as a group and sort of evaluating, is there anything missing off the list, do you think? No. No, okay. <laughs> I'll take, I'll take an answer, I'll take a no, that's good. And I think the other thing too is do, because we are missing a few um, members, what we'll do is we'll capture the conversation in the meeting notes. I will invite other members to say if you have contributions to make via email about ideas or things that you would have said had you been here, certainly it's not because you aren't here that you do, don't get to chime in. Um, hey, Carrie. Yeah. Does in, in A, does the word condition imply year-round so that it's insulated, et cetera? Yeah, so that's a, um, a building terminology, so condition space is occupiable space. Shannon, can you think of a different word we could use maybe that would be? I mean, we could use permanent. as it's full year. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah like a, a year-round structure like you would this building. Yeah. Can, can you elaborate a little bit more on the partial year versus the full year and what that sort of means at a high level as far as what would need to be done? So I think um, like a temporary seasonal basis, um, you know, that it, so you're not going to be living in it. Um, so it doesn't maybe need, it doesn't maybe meet the same code requirements. I don't know offhand exactly what that would look like. Um, but any kind of farmer's market that you can think of, like how it's just a kind of like a plain structure. There's not a lot to it. Um, it doesn't necessarily have insulation or um, amenities to it. Um, something along those sorts. I think it depends on what the use is. It's a little hard to say without knowing the exact use of what you would need for it. Yeah, and I think in the New York State Uniform Code, you'd have to you have to take a look to see sort of, okay, what improvements are you looking to make? Uh, the temporary basis is defined in New York State Code, and you can certainly correct me, but typically it has to be in use less than 180 days. It's like six months out of the year type of a thing. Um, a lot of times that that is a reference or that's a sort of a standard that's applied to things like, you know, uh, uh, greenhouses and things that are put up temporarily for a period of time and then taken down. They don't need to meet the same standard as a structure that's going to be an assembly space. Right, and that's not something that we deal with too often, so I'm not overly familiar with that code. Right, right. Would it require restrooms? Well, that's a question. We would want to get some clarity about whether or not could a porta potty serve the, you know, the could a porta potty function for the season for the for the season as an option. Um, I think the short answer would probably be yes. We have other parks with other park 
you know, open air structures that yeah, we, don't have. Yeah, we have the open air shelter, you know, right on, right on this property. We have it down at Linear in it's basically first come first serve it's seasonal so if you i mean if you want to hang out there in the winter time you can it's open but there's a less there's no walls to it but i'm assuming there's re less codes for it just because it's well you have to meet the standard of yeah. construction that it it yes. will stand and not blow over in the wind Correct. like that's <laughs> Correct. That, yeah so i think we'd have to take a look a closer look at the town code or the town forgive me not the town code the state building codes that might apply um and that we can certainly take a closer look at that to figure out where this would land. I think part of it would be understanding what the proposed use of it would be to know how to classify it. Mm -hmm. Because that's the first thing that has to be done is to decide, okay, what use type is this from the purposes of the building code? Exactly, yeah, it has to be classified before you can even know where to look. Yeah. And then it's a choose your, no, it's not a choose your own <laughs> ending. That's the wrong terminology. But it is definitely a, if this, then go to this. If that, go there. Yes. And sometimes it, no offense to the state code, sometimes it can send you in a circle or say, says uh, two different things, depending on where you look. But, exactly. Uh, that's, a, that's a conversation for a different time. So, Tom, I just added in to be used as condition permanently occupiable space. Is that maybe a little bit more clear? Sure. OK. Um, Um, and I think maybe, do we want to add here with limited or no amenities? Like, yeah. okay. Okay. And then, um, for C, it would be the structure is restored on the exterior, the foundation, roof, um, but locked at all times. So not not entered by anyone except maybe for town staff to monitor or do what they might need to do for, you know, maintenance purposes. So the shorthand way that we would kind of refer to this in the preservation world would be like stabilization, so that's structurally sound, and you know the roof, you know, the elements are no longer getting in the building. Um, and I say stabilizes the structure? Yeah, is that yeah. a better I mean, word? That's, yeah, that's kind of how people, I think, I like you it. know, the building trades would refer to it. Um, stabilizes and or and possibly mothballs. You know, when you mothball a structure, you're kind of um, closing it up with the idea that, that um, it could be used further down the road. Gotcha. So you're sort of putting, pressing the pause button and, yeah. and stabilizing the structure. And you do things like, you know, you secure the building, of course, but you also, um, you know, account for like ventilation and stuff like that. Okay. So that things don't get... Grow. Must, yeah, <laughs> molder. <laughs> so you, that would include the floor? Of fixing the floor? Or or it's not I mean, you year. know, like typically with stabiliza stabilization, we're talking about securing the roof and securing the, the structure itself so that it's, you know, not going to fall down and further deteriorate. All right. So it, it may so, not necessarily involve um, fixing deteriorated elements that aren't structural. And do you think in that scenario, if the foundation is holding up the building, right because the building's standing so by virgin would it be a matter of just it's re repairing or replacing boards on the exterior re repairing replacing roof elements and making sure there's no major sort of points of entry for weather and or uh i mean to the extent that you can um vermin Right, so that we don't have, we don't just create a giant. Yeah, I mean, I think house. the goal with like stabilization and or mothballing in preservation is to buy you time until okay. other opportunities or funding sure. present themselves. Okay, thank you. That's a good clarification. So they wouldn't. So number. So number C. <laughs> Letter C wouldn't be a permanent fixture. It would be a, like you said, Carrie, like a pause. So that right. just pushes the problem down the road a little. Mm -hmm. Potentially. Potentially. Yeah, so I think, um, it, yeah, I think it's 
or it, it, and forgive me for like the maybe the not the right analogy or you're creating a lovely um, building that's a statue type of a thing. Yep, yep. Like, do you know what I mean? Yes. It would yes. be as if, for example, the Statue of Liberty, yep. if no one could go inside of it, right. there it is. A landmark, you, per se. You, yeah, a yep. landmark. That's yep. a much better way of saying it. Um, so, yeah, be okay. like a piece of art or a landmark. Yep. I mean, I will say just for clarity, not to belabor the point, but like as a preserva as from a preservation perspective, we certainly wouldn't advocate stabilization as a permanent solution. Okay. All right, that's that's fair. Thank you. Do we see any other changes, tweaks, modifications to the potential alternatives to an to analyze? I don't think D seems very likely. Personally, because it's. It's just been sitting there as it is. Why would the town bother to relocate it and then restore it? So I, I don't know if that's right or wrong. I don't know. I wonder if it's worth, do we explore it as an option and then keep it on the table and then we can decide as we gather more information whether it should stay or go? Is that fair? Mm -hmm. And you're right, I don't know if that's a viable option. Um, and I think that, you know, that's certainly something that we could, um, as part of the review of these alternatives and continued discussion by the committee, that might be a question to raise with um, our town board representatives um, at the next meeting. And, you know, that, that's a fair question. So any other, any other changes or tweaks? You can, you're allowed, Caitlin. You're, that's why you're here. No, I just, well, I, I don't want to complicate things, but I'm just curious, um, do, are you able to easily pull up like a, a view of the parcel? Oh, sure. Yeah, that's why I said you're <laughs> That's why I said you're here. So I can amaze you with my, no. <laughs> it opens on here. Oh, well, actually, it's going to open up to our GS viewer, so that's perfect. In theory, the computer should only open to very professional pages, <laughs> uh, but in case somebody was in here and, like, searching for, like, the, a new car. <laughs> So here we are. So this is the barn mm -hmm. property here. Um, and again, these two are technically the same parcel, mm -hmm. same parcel ID number, um, but separated by Clark Road. Yeah, I mean, it may be early to say, but it just doesn't seem like t making a hole in the middle is a particularly good idea, particularly if. Uh, in the future, the mine or something as well, maybe is, you know, operations are finished. I thought that there were that that might be available in the future even. So, putting a hole in the middle of it by selling the property seems like an odd choice. Mm -hmm. Putting a hole in the middle of I'm sorry, I just of the larger property seems like a an odd choice. If that were sold, if this piece were sold, yeah. Okay. Because you've got the north property and the south property, and then maybe, maybe even later. Uh, Understood. I don't know so what if it was sold to a third party. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think that um, that's a that's a fair um, comment. I think again, though, it, is it worth? Because I know at one point, is it worth considering and then and then having that represented in the rankings accordingly if it doesn't make sense or work out that it's a good idea. Well, it would have to be that whoever bought it would keep it. I mean, yes. to keep that consistency of north and south and potential lake there with the quarry. But I, I don't see how the, the rubric kind of stuff that you have even would represent, you know, the 
if that property were sold, how would, how would even that enter into the rankings around maybe the loss of value, maybe of the larger property being consistent, being whole? So that's something is shed the Shadow Pines master plan consistency. If when it's brought, when it's bought by another entity, yeah, I was whatever say, the use would be, it had to be consistent with the shadow right. plans. So I know it's hard. This is a really hard thing to do when you're coming up with alternatives and shooting them out of the barrel before you even get to that part of the process. And it's like brainstorming, where people like are brainstorming ideas, and then instantly you have like reaction to the ideas and think they're terrible. Often we tell people, hold on to that idea or hold on to your thoughts about it and we'll have a place for you to, to shoot it down. Um, I think that the, um, I, couple of, a couple of things just from a pragmatic standpoint, from a sale, if the sale were to be something that the town wanted to undertake or think about just as a playing devil's advocate, the RFP and or the terms of the transfer could dictate you know, maintenance and, and restoration of the structure for perpetuity. There could be cross-access easements, the same as any other development where cross-access easements um, are required so that people have free access to cut across the property. Like, now, might those be reasons why it wouldn't be viable? Sure. Um, maybe somebody would be like, I don't want to buy a barn if I can't have full and total control over it. Um, and does the town own the adjacent parcel? Yes. Okay. So just for some clarity, this parcel is owned um, by the town of Penfield. It was pur purchased directly with, I say cash, I don't think they brought a bucket of cash to buy it, but it was bought with a uh, general fund balance. <laughs> and if Barbara Chirdo, our, our finance director, brought a bucket of cash somewhere, I would want uh, to see that. But that's not how it happened. But it was bought directly with uh, town funds. The remainder of the Shadow Pines property, which is here, and I know I'm missing, I'm, I'm going to zoom out a little bit so we can see the full sort of extent. It's this, this, um, those parcels that made up the front and back nine of the former golf course were purchased through a 30 year bond. And so the no changes in ownership, no conveyance of any portion of the land can take place um, during that 30 year bond period. Does that make sense? Wait, say, say it again. So the, <laughs> the, un, the, the portions of the, of the former golf course that just were golf course. Okay, so that doesn't include the parcel that the barn is on. The, the, the parcel that the barn is on and the former Clark House and the Clark House were on those two, um, that property is bought by the town and not subject to the bond limitations. So this just raised one uh, question for me as terms of an option that's related, but I don't see it explicitly outlined or okay. an al alternative, I should say, um, is like, is, is the town leasing the barn? And like a long-term lease where maybe another entity rehabs it and operates it. Oh, okay, interesting. Uh, that's not is a, a specified separate. Um, okay, let's, uh, we can, uh, before I add it in, is, are people comfortable with that addition, if we add another? Does that happen often with like, like I guess refurbished barns? getting leased out by different companies? I mean, I, I, off the top of my head, I can't think of a barn specifically, but it's certainly a model. Um, you know, we're working like with the state of New York on a property in Geneva where, um, you know, ultimately um, it might take on that model. And like the state of New York owns the property and we have like a friends group that's undertaking a major like stabilization. Okay. So yeah, it's definitely a model that, okay. um, you know, we've well, utilized. how about we put, um, or yeah, some kind of other arrangement. <laughs> okay, we do <laughs> municipal, and I will. Basically where, you know, the idea being that another entity undertakes the financial burden, but the, pro the town still retains, you know, ownership. I guess is what I'm getting at. Okay. 
I mean, someone would take over the financial responsibility to fix it up, but only in order to lease it? Yeah, you know, let's say some, I'm just going to pick a random concept, but some for-profit entity wants to rehab the barn and operate it as a wedding venue. Um, I'm not saying that's realistic or a good idea. I'm just saying. they're rehabbing, not. The, and so they have, you know, let's say a 20 or 30 year lease on the property and, you know, they, or a friends group or something forms. Um, that's definitely something I've seen happen. Okay, so town retains ownership and leases barn to third party for restoration and use. Is that a fair capture of what your sure. thought yeah. is? Okay. So I think, you know, as far as, um, and one of the things you'll see in a minute, do we have any other modifications or changes to this? Okay. So I think what we're going to do is if you, everybody's okay, I think well, let's jump to the evaluation rubric and we can go through. Now, again, this was... I, we took the initial sort of list of evaluation topics. There were some additions that were identified by the, this committee at the last meeting. And then we took, made an attempt to develop the rubric for how would you score the things based on that category. I will share with you that um, Sri, who was at our first meeting. She's a member of the committee, resident member of the committee, also is serving on the Parks and Recreation. Yeah, she's the chairperson for that too. The, for the yes. Parks and Rec chairperson. She had mentioned, she, the, the, the idea of a rubric was actually her idea, so I can't even take credit for it, although I would love to, but it was her idea. And she had offered saying that she does a lot of rubric work with her day job, and that she would love to provide any input or feedback. So. Um, she wasn't going to be available for today's meeting, but I did float this to her so she could give give some feedback. And she said she thought the metrics looked good and seemed very clear. So I'm just sharing that feedback. That doesn't mean we can't make changes here. I'm just saying one committee person vetted what Matt and I um, worked on. So this was a you know sort of a collective effort, and also ba based on feedback of what we heard from from the committee. So. We're scoring one through five, with one being low and five being high, meaning a good, you know, one being the worst, five being the best. So I think, and you'll see here on the left-hand side, these are presented in alphabetical order, not in any order of like what we think is most important, what we think is the biggest concern. I just think when we're presenting information, having it be alphabetical makes it then there's no sort of implicit bias in how I've presented the information or how the town has presented the information. Um, so facilities priority, it's not a priority at all. It's low priority compared to other town facilities needs, moderate priority compared to other fa town facilities needs, high priority compared to other town facilities needs, very high priori priority. And, um, and I think we can talk about maybe in more detail what that means. <coughs> The town has identified other projects that need to happen from a facility standpoint. Um, the one that you might be the most familiar with is the town needs to con is going in the process of constructing a new DPW facility. Um, that project is underway and moving along the the approval process and moving toward um, design. Um, the other priorities that have been identified in a general, in addition to just general maintenance upkeep of our existing stuff, um, the future for need of future recreation uh, building or space. Um, the town currently uh, recreation department is housed in a former school building that also houses the library and the court. Um, and everybody's sort of outgrowing their, collect their respective spaces. So. That's one identified need of new recreational facility, recreation center, if you will. The other identified um, uh, modifications would be to the building that we're sitting in in the town hall. At some point, the town needs to make renovations, either additions or reconfiguration of existing space um, to accommodate staffing and just in general to be able to improve operations and delivery of service. 
And then I think all, then then also the library and court and how do we reconfigure the you know the building that is over on on Baird Road, and then other projects or priorities that may also come up that might not be physical structures but could be you know public infrastructure you know sewer um, lighting all the things that the town is responsible for maintaining upkeeping replacing and upgrading so that's what when you're comparing this project to those those things um Eric, can the town provide us a list of what those are Yes, with, with we, can, we can provide a draft. I don't know that we have a, like a solidified, mm -hmm. um, but I can certainly find out if we have a, a sort of a, a working draft of what those yeah. ballpark numbers might be. Okay. Um, then historic preservation. Again, uh, no historic preservation at all. Minor preservation of historic materials. Moderate preservation of historic materials. Preservation or restoration of structure only preservation, restoration of structure and site. And I think there probably is some way, and I'm, I'm looking at my two subject matter experts, that we might be able to tweak this a little bit to make this more usable as a, matri as a, as a metric. And especially in light of the conversation we just had about stabilizing versus, like maybe the word stabilize shows up as, um, uh, um, number four, you know, three or four, and then I don't know if you have thoughts about how to make this better. And we are all ears. Well, is it meant to be historic preservation value? It's meant to be like on the scale of one to five, one being it's, there's no preservation at all, right? And five means the thing has been restored and to a shiny new object, well, a shiny old object, as the case may be. So, so and you don't. Can I just ask? So. What are we doing? With, what, are we going to go through and write down what we think? So or how is this going to work? What we're trying to do right now is agree on the rubric mm -hmm. so that at a future date, after we've collected more information, talked about okay. information that you might need to evaluate each of the alternatives, ultimately, this, the, the alternatives that we've just tweaked a few minutes ago everybody in this group is going to have an opportunity to rank okay. those alternatives based on these metrics. And we can sort of have an estimate of, okay, here's the ones that are dropping to the bottom, mm -hmm. here's the ones that are rising to the top, okay. and then further discuss those and determine sort of what direction. And, and that's how we're gonna maybe try to work toward achieving a recommendation to the town board. Okay. Um, and so today we're not doing any ranking. We're not, I don't want, I almost want to have you forget the alternatives, except in the fact that we need to think about what do we mean by historic preservation, what's a one versus what's a five. So that we're all coming to it with the same sort of like mindset of, um, you know, it's a, it's a one for me because it's the, this alternative is not rest restoring or has no historic preservation or this is a five for me because this is exactly what we think we should be doing. Yeah, I think I, um, I can definitely come up with some thoughts as to how I might tweak that, that wording. Okay. But I, I don't know if I can do it right now. <laughs> and, you, and I'm not trying to put okay. anybody in the spot. So um, this is the time where I'm gonna put a little note uh, next to here that we're gonna say, Caitlin, and I think you know uh, uh, when I've kind of when I've used r kind of scoring rubrics right like this for say um, an award scoring grants oh, yep. or um, you know trying to choose like a contractor um, you know on a big project sure. um, I, I think it's helpful to also and I realize this is just a starting point so this yes. isn't like a critique I, I think it's also critique helpful away I'm to, not uh, <laughs> I'm not shy or I think it's helpful to kind of flesh out. Um, you know, uh, what do we mean by historic preservation? Um, yes. What are some questions you want to ask yourself as you're determining what score you assign, and and and, and all like fleshing out kind of I, how I, you arrive at you know number two or you know right. Sort of thing. So I think that's a really fair point, and I think um, what what we similar to what I just explained to you with the facilities priority, 
there could be some sort of prompting questions or bullets underneath that. Exactly. Is that yeah. okay? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And I think that's very helpful. I, I appreciate that feedback. Because I agree with that. Because that number five, the uh, site and or the structure and site, like on my end of things with the parks department, what kind of site um, restoration is that? Just a whole site restoration with flowers, like mini gardens, that kind of thing. I don't know what the group. That's a group question, I guess, with bullet points under that. Right. So I think one of the things is that, you know, full preservation, does that mean restoration and the use of the property year round? Like, is that what a five is? Or does that just mean that the building's been restored and the site's maintained in a lovely way, okay. that it looks nice? Yeah. So those are the kinds of things we can okay. talk about. Right, right, exactly. Yeah. I think, you know, this is, it's, it, it was interesting because when we were looking at the topics, we're like, oh, yes, these are the things we've, and then we were trying to figure, I'm like, oh, how do we, like, how do you classify sort of what's a, a one rating versus a five? Right. Um, so we can come back to this one, and maybe um, this might be one that we'll present at the next meeting, a revised version that will give some lead time for Caitlin to maybe work, we can work offline with our subject matter experts to tweak that a little bit. And we can also look at whether or not we break this into two versions of historic, like it could be restoration and, per, like there could be some, we might be able to finesse this a little bit. There might be a little bit more nuanced. Um, the next category is initial construction cost. Thank you so much. Thank you. I know I, I have to go. Yeah, no, no, that's okay. If you have any other thoughts on the rubric you want to email, okay. Feel free to email my, myself, that'd be wonderful. I will. Thank okay, you. thank you, appreciate it. So the initial construction cost, um, you'll see that, um, and I'm gonna start with a five, normally we would go to the one. Five is under 35,000, and the 35,000 is not sort of a make-believe number, that is the that is the point at which a public bid is needed. So anything less than that would be pretty like easy to manage budget-wise, easier to manage budget-wise. Um, then we have as four, thirty-five to ninety-nine thousand dollars. Then number three is a hundred to two hundred fifty thousand, not quite two hundred fifty thousand dollars. Then we have two fifty to four ninety-nine, and then we have five hundred thousand and up. And I think. You know the cost is going to be a factor, so the more expensive something is, might be an issue with respect to whether or not it's viable, feasible, uh, something that the town can move forward with. But Karen, and, uh, uh, not, not to prolong this, but the uh, to me that's like the number one thing we got to know right? uh, before we even bother going through. A well, so here's what I'm going to say is, again, we're just coming up with the final rubric to make sure that we agree with like sort of the, the stages of scoring. And then when we're going to close this meeting with what additional information do you, like once we have this matrix sort of finalized, what information does the committee need to either, we need to gather, we need to talk about in order for individuals to be able to move forward with scoring the alternatives based on this information. So right now, it, the we're using this sort of as a, you know, if it's more than $500,000 for the decision, it doesn't mean that that means it can't happen. We have to look to see how, do the, how does the, an item rank in the other categories, right? Because there's gonna be give and take. There might be, it might be a town revenue source, it might be ten, town of Penfield use, you know, like, so there are going to be things that might offset the score. So money is going to always be important, but it might not be the only factor that drives whether or not an alternative is viable or not viable, or an alternative something is something that the committee wants to recommend to the town board or doesn't. And I think we'll have to sort of wait and see how that plays out. But I'm hearing from you that understanding sort of the uh, scale or scope of cost is going to be something that you want to understand. Oh, absolutely. And, right. And and what the what the town's uh, sort of limitation is based on what you're talking about with the, with all of the um, the other projects that are going on. Sure. And I think. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, go ahead. No, no. You go ahead. Well, I was just going to say. Um, you know, getting real numbers as to like what does option A cost? What does option B cost? You know, that that's like. 
that costs money to get those numbers. Um, and so it, I almost, I, I don't know if that's within the scope of this committee to solicit that kind of information. Yeah, so that's gonna be one of the things we'll have to talk about. Um, so I guess I'm, I wanna leave tonight's meeting sort of with an understanding of what information people think they need in order to evaluate and then we can determine how to what extent we can get that information reasonably. And it might be not a full estimation, it's a you know planning level cost analysis, you know, cost estimate versus a fully engineered this is what it's gonna take. Um, but I, that's certainly something we can also um, talk again with our town board representatives to find out sort of okay, what's reasonable um, as far as investigation. And, and you know maybe one option if it's not reasonable to kind of get hard numbers on things is maybe make these categories for like cost like relative so like it's just low cost moderate cost high you know high at lowest high, middle high yeah. something like that you right know what I mean? we can certainly look at that i think we um and as we go further a little bit down maybe we'll see Let's, let's continue on and then we can always come back. And I think we're open to changing sort of the scaling of this and how we're quantifying or classifying the scoring. Um, so the, there's the upfront cost associated with whatever the alternative is. And then there's also the long-term operation costs. So one is very high operation cost. And I wanna give you, uh, there's a little one at the top here. And this is based on the 2022 facilities budget figures, 1% equals $12,000 of their current operating budget for facilities. So that's why we use sort of, if you see here, we'll start again backwards. Five is there's no operational costs, staff, time and materials, zero change to annual budget. So whatever the outcome is or that alternative is, there's no change to the operational costs. Four is minimal operational costs. There's no budget increase needed. In other words, there's an, there's an increase, but or there's minimal operational costs, but it's able to be absorbed, or things can be shifted around, um, or it can sort of be piggybacked on with other things that are happening. Moderate operational cost is, um, you're gonna see a 1% increase to the, to the budget annually. High operational cost is gonna be anywhere between that 1%, over 1% to 5% increase in operational cost. And then very high was anything that's more than 5% annually as, as a result of this, whatever the alternative is, if that makes sense. Because then that's a fixed cost that the town has to account for from now until the end of days. Um, I th and we used, um, and just so you know that I don't pluck numbers, especially since that's not my area of expertise. I did have a conversation with our controller, a finance director, so we, I, I, you know, one person, so I could check my math. Um, but we thought that that was a, a fair sort of way to look at it, because this would be a facility that gets maintained like all the other facilities in town. Um, and then uh, public slash community use. One is the public will not be able to use the property. Um, and I, maybe we say at all. The public will have minimal use of the property. The public will have moderate use of the property. Uh, public will have regular use of the property. Um, public will have uh, highly frequent, oh, I forgot a sentence here, use. Um, And then um, we included Shadow Pines master plan consistency. And I'll bring up some information that might be helpful and I'll put it in the Google Drive as well that sort of provides here are sort of the intended or preferred uses for this par parcel and here are the things that we don't want, meaning the entire Shadow Pines, not just 1960 Clark Road. That, that master plan was looking at the entirety of the property. Um, so we, the, the sort of the continuum for this category was does not support any of the desired uses or provo proposed improvements of the master plan, supports one of the desired uses or proposed improvements, supports two, supports three, or supports four or more. 
that's fairly straightforward, I think. I don't, you know, we just figured, you know, sort of sliding scale. Town revenue source, again, because this is something that you have to think of as well. If it's a facility that's being highly used, it could generate revenue. So one is none, no revenue. Um, I'm going to maybe say that. Um, less than operation and maintenance costs. Um, and that's so that's, you know, breaks even with operation and maintenance costs. Revenue exceeds operation and maintenance slightly. Revenue exceeds O&M significantly. And we might say revenue expected to exceed, like we might not know that definitively. So we might have some more like is expected to, anticipated to exceed or expected or anticipated to be less than. Um, then we have the town of Penfield use, like us as a town, um, T town would never use the property under this alternative. The town would rarely use the property under this alternative. Um, and we did, and like we put in some time frames just to give some sense of scale. Um, the town would use the property sometimes under this alternative, average one event per month. Um, and I may put event or activity so that it's, because um, it might not be an event per se, but it might be something. Um, I really need Excel to add spell check. <laughs> and it does not have it, and it's been many, many years. Um, then. So, can I ask a quick question? You can. So, when you have the term town of Penfield use, you're not referring to just the structure of the town, you're talking about the citizens of the town? No, so this is like the programming. Like the town's utilizing this for some function okay, for recreational space, so, or yeah, so, or some like other type of use. Like I, I'm not sure what that might. I don't want to like jump too far ahead to say what that could be. But yeah, so, in, just an example would be like uh, our town health fair that we hold on. We use that. We use Dolomite Lodge for that once a year. That would be that type of deal where right. the town employees would go there for their health fair. And the revenue sources are third party use, if you will. So revenue would be the town is charging somebody right. to use the space right. or the that's, you're that's where you're catching that group of people. They're outside the, the right. staff of the town right? and we're citizens or thing, groups to use it. The other thing that like, so for example, depending on what the build, what, what the alternative is, if the alternative means that the town could be organizing activities that are advertised in our recreational program and somebody's paying to sign up for it, meaning that it's not just town staff using it, it's town staff using it to administer services. Right, like summer camps that they do right now. Correct, yeah, and so the like. Only, and the only other thing I was trying to join there is those two are not mutually exclusive. Correct, right, so um, the, um, forgive me, the, the, there's some, could be some overlap, right? There are right. some scenarios where that, both of those the things could be more happening. More can be used the better, and I just, there's just not, you're not going to exclude yourself from the town using it if it's open to the public. Right. And vice versa. Cor correct. Yeah, like yeah. a perfect example would be Harris Whale and Lodge Lower that sometimes they in the morning they use that for summer camps, then it's rented out to the public for at nighttime. Right. That's so a great example. So it's multi-use. Yeah. yeah. So it's dedicated town space for some times, and then it's open to the public for public rental other times. That's a really good example. Um, okay, then we are on... Uh, Town maintenance demand, daily ongoing maintenance required, weekly maintenance required, monthly maintenance required, seasonal maintenance required, no maintenance required. And you'll see that, you know, sort of that this is, and this is somewhat connected to operations and maintenance, so maybe this can go away, but this sort of gives a sense of time requirement. Mm -hmm. Not just the money. Yeah, I think it would be a sub, like a sub point under the. And it's only in this order because it's in yeah. we're in we're yep, in yep, alphabetical yep. order. Yeah. And if we start mm -hmm. monkeying around with changing it, then. Yeah, I don't want to do that. Oh, is it a different department? It's not a different department. I'm saying we could have moved this up, like underneath operation and maintenance, like with the, where that had more of a money connection, long term operation costs. This is somewhat connected to that. But this is like sort of, okay, how many do I have to have, we have to have town people at the site, how often? Yeah, I'm just thinking of how, how your uh, accountant breaks up the cost. 
you might have different people responsible for making the estimates and, and different departments having you know different uh, priorities well and i think you know from a and tim this is really your you you know yep. you're the one who's sending people out to take care of whatever yeah. facilities so it basically be like my grounds crew my parks department we would mow it either bi-weekly or weekly. So that would be my department doing that. Then it would be Jim Crackman's facilities guys going in there either daily or weekly to clean it, to change if there's bathrooms there, that kind of deal. So we'd have to pull those numbers together to yeah, figure so out. Yeah, so that's what I mean, there's two departments. Yes. Yeah. 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 So I think they should keep it separate then. Okay. Oh, fair, fair. Yeah. The other thing too for town maintenance, it's also another stop for town security. Yes. Um, as well. So we can, when we can sort of try to capture that a little bit. And then we put, finally, because ultimately any decision that gets made by the town board is being uh, supported fiscally by the, the town, town's taxpayers. And so there's no return on tax dollars paid, very minimal return on tax dollars paid. There's some return on tax dollars paid. There's moderately high return on tax dollars paid there's very high return, there's very high um, uh, return on tax dollars paid. So the, you know, sort of, and that, and this is a one that's gonna maybe be subjective because my idea of, of a value, valuable asset and something might be different than anyone else sitting at the table. And so- Well, yeah, I guess you should be clear with this is, is this a, tangible or intangible like what do you what is value if you're considering it just dollar value then i think because that's how i interpreted it no like, i think this is more like how important this is this to a taxpayer like how i see okay yeah i yes that's not how i read it okay well if that's how you read it then that means we have to change the words because because i read it are is the town and therefore the taxpayers getting a return on their investment like fiscally that's how i read it. oh i see what you're saying so maybe that's not what we were we were trying to get to. It was more of a, is this a worthwhile investment for mm -hmm. the town? Yeah, and there couldn't be some you know intangible benefit. Right, right. So like right. where I like you and I could be both looking at the same project or same town decision to spend money on something, and you could say we absolutely have to spend money on that, and I could say we absolutely should not. That's terrible. Like and and leave space for that sort of variation because not everybody is going to feel the same way about, you know, same decision of like, well, no, we need soccer fields. Well, no, we really need something else. And I think I've just opened a can of worms by even saying that out loud. <laughs> so please strike that from this part of the meeting. We're talking about the, the Clark barn. <laughs> um, but do you know what I mean? Like, so yes. mm. one person's idea of like a must do investment is different than other people. And generally it's associated with what you're- Where you are in, in life. Where you are in life, what you're interested and passionate about. You know what I mean? So, you know, what we think we have to spend our money. And the same way you do it in your own house. Like, if you really like going out to nice dinners, then you go out to nice dinners. But if you don't like doing that, then you're spending your money, you know, doing something different. And if my husband's watching this meeting, <laughs> I like nice dinners. <laughs> well, yeah, I think the analogy too is like, you can spend, uh, let's say $50,000 redoing your kitchen. Maybe you get a financial return on investment. Maybe you don't, but it makes your, Happy. improves your quality of life, you know? Yes, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think we have to change this then to say, um, and I don't know how we're gonna say this, so, <laughs> I think what we'll, we'll come back, because we're gonna come back with a, sort of a tweaked historic preservation piece. So what we can do is work on that and maybe circulate it via email to everyone as after we've made those tweaks and then get some feedback and maybe we can refine it. And um, that's something I think is relatively easy to do electronically via email and we not have to wait until the next meeting to necessarily uh, finalize that. Um, Okay, so now we've come to the, I'm gonna add a sheet so I can just make notes um, in theory. Here we are, slide that over. So I guess the next thing that we wanna talk about is sort of what information does this group would like to have or need to have maybe for the next meeting to be able to move forward and, and eventually 
look at this those uh, alternatives and provide some scores to them. So the Tom, I'm going to go back and say that you. Can I, can I just, before yeah, we yeah, can yeah. I just ask one question sure about can. the categories? Um, the facilities priority one made me think: is there um, is it worthwhile to capture? Do, do the alternatives meet some kind of townwide priority? Like, is there a master plan oh, that that's outlines a great... specific, you know, goals so that it would be here's meeting? what we're going to do. And I'm, it's, this is not in alphabetical order, and I will fix that. And I think comprehensive plan. Yeah. We, the, the town is actually, this is timely, the town has a draft 2023 comprehensive plan update currently out in the world under review. The town board will be having its public hearing for the comprehensive plan at their legislative meeting next uh, Wednesday. So anybody who hasn't had a chance to take a look at the comprehensive plan, now is your time. Um, it is on the website under projects of community interest. Um, so certainly check that out. But that's a good, um, a, always an important, you know, sort of uh, standard by which to evaluate. I think we can say, and maybe it's going to be something like, this is a, a wordy one, um, spell check, okay, and we'll do a little, and wrap. okay, that's a good one, and we'll come up with some range here to make that, um, and this is more of a, um, this is really what we were saying, like taxpayer priority, not return on investment. Mm -hmm. I think, Caitlin, you call it quality of life. I think that uh, better describes it. Mm -hmm. Oh. Or like a social value. Well. Let's see. Well, I, oh. yeah, it's like, what are you trying to capture? Are you trying to capture, like, whether this is meeting the residents' demand? demand? Oh, maybe that's it. Maybe citizen demand? Citizen um, demand slash support? Yeah. Because that's different than asking the question I think you're saying is, does it have, what can we argue is the larger public benefit? Um, you know what I mean? Like those are kind of two different. Well, here's the thing. To me. Yeah. So I think public benefit is another category. <laughs> Sorry. That's all right. Now this is why we're meeting. This is why we have this meeting, so we can think about these things. You know, there's no there's no harm in having there be multiple criteria by which we're evaluating something. I don't think there's you know that's I don't think that's ever going to be a problem. Um, so I think for, uh, you know, I think if anything, it ensures that you've looked at something from as many possible angles as possible in thinking about whether something's, you know, a high score or a low score or somewhere in the middle. So I'm not afraid of having too many uh, evaluation criteria. My follow-up question for this, like, rubric category that we're discussing right now is this, when we're scoring it, you know, thinking ahead, when we're scoring it, is this going to be like our, what we personally think the value would be if we are a Penfield resident? Or are we trying to imagine what the community as a whole would so, consider to be valuable? I think you have to respond as a committee member because it's like, so going back to Caitlin's example of I'm, we're scoring grant applications. I'm looking at the grant application from my perspective, looking at based on the series of criteria and where do I think it lands based on the information that I've been asked to look at it through that lens. So I think that's what we're asking each of you as individuals. And everybody's going to be coming at it from their own lived experience, personal preferences, you know, things that you feel are good, bad, indifferent, or important or not important. So that's where the matrix sort of and the multiple people scoring it, I think, then helps to sort of maybe get to some middle ground compromise that everybody can hopefully live with. And then what I will share with you is that, 
you know, say we get to the end of the time where we're, we've done the final, like we've figured out the, the rubric, we've asked, every, we've gotten to the point where we feel comfortable doing the ranking of the, in, the alternatives and it's a flat tie between things, I think that's gonna be maybe okay to say, here's the information, this is the evaluation that was done, these are the scoring, like this is how the committee members scored it, individually and collectively, um, and this is where it landed. And then the summary or memo to the town board can just sort of document that process, and that's okay. So it's just like getting to the point where, you know, in a grant proposal or in the awarding of a bid, you get to a point where you like, you have a tie. And then maybe the town board is the one who has to break the tie. And if there is a tie, there may not be a tie. So we don't know that yet. We're too early in the process. One of the thing that was raised before in the last meeting was like, how common are these barns? Like, what is the what is the historical cost of if this barn were chosen to be demolished? Um, you know, does the town have a duty to preserve that? Uh, you know, if there's, you know, ten thousand of these in the county or something, then maybe it doesn't matter so much if the one barn is is uh, demolished or something. But if there's only a few, then maybe it's more important or something. So I don't know how that's captured here. I mean, I think that's a good thing to add to the list that you were starting before I interrupted you. <laughs> so this is the list of, and I have them sorted by year of construction from the town assessor. Um, they only went through the 19, and again, the, the actual year of construction, whether that's accurate, not accurate, it's just handed down from assessor to assessor to assessor. Um, but this is what is in our real property system. I think he stopped 1950, because after 1950, not that we don't care about the barn, but does it change? And, it, and Caitlin and or Sarah, if you tell me, no, 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 go into 1965, because they were still constructing wood barns until then, and it's still relevant, this, we can ask the assessor to pull up to whatever year. Like Tim, do you see your, or your is your barn on here? 141, I believe, number 141. Number up here, you mean? Yes. Oh, look at you eyeballed that as I was scrolling. You sent an email. I look over. Oh, the that's email. <laughs> you that's pa right. I see. I'm wow. Not just a pretty face. <laughs> I do work around here. We knew that, you're, Tim. You're hoping the town board is watching this meeting in this moment, <laughs> and there's going to be like gold star for Tim. You read so, your so emails. It better be 144. <laughs> that's right. I'm going to put it. What no, was, 141. 141, you said. You did say 141. Yes. Look at that. There you are. Yeah. So. Um, I think that's a generic 1900s. Yeah. I believe. Right. So I yes. think the 1900 mark could be 1902, 1903. Like, it might not be. Like, that would be a lot of barns going up in, in the year of 1900. So it might be not a thousand. But, like, this is going to be the best that we can do as far as data points, I think. Unless you know. But are you also asking, like, at, on a larger scale, how, you know, rare is this? Kind like of not what is, what the, is the cost, the historical cost of this individual barn or something like that? Um. I think that's a good, like, I think that should go maybe on your list of what are data point, what are things the committee needs to know is, right. is, is maybe some assessment of, like, and I couldn't, I can't give that to you off the top of my head. I don't know what you said. Yeah, no, I definitely would need to do more research on like the history of the property to really understand like what its value really is. Is it, is like, it one of 10 or one of a thousand? Exactly. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So you want to have a, what's a good way to categorize like that data point? Um, histo I'm going to say this word and this is, you're going to kill me. No, it's like historic. Ah. What, uh, what, 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 what? Like historic significance. Okay. Um, Rarity. Yeah, I mean, that's Relevancy. It. Um, okay. We can, I mean, again, this is for our internal purposes of like what we're trying to gather um, and sort of the, you know, this is like, you know, is it the, is it the la like the holy grail, like the last of a thing, or is it one of a few of a thing, or is it one of, like you said, a hundred of a thing? 
is it thousands of, you know, like that's a sort of a, a sense of scale, historic preservation scale. Doesn't, that doesn't even make sense, but. But the know, list you have, Carrie, the, the, I mean, there's several hundred there. Um, yeah. But I think the size is important. Is there any way to, to, uh, to split that list up by the big ones and the little ones? Yeah, so hold on for one second. I'm gonna just pull that back up again. You'll see the square f improved square footage. Shows oh, okay. Up I didn't notice that. That's what they at, the, at that last column. And you know what? This is the, these are the the headers um, from the assessor's real property system. Super not like easy to read if you don't know what that those things mean. So what we'll do is we'll clean this up so it has headers that make sense for everyday people, and then we can put it in the Google uh, Drive that um, the committee has access mm -hmm. to. So then, you know, you get a sense of scale and size. And just for, um, bear with me for a second, the, the Clark Road is up here in the 18, it's right here. So it's, we have it as provided as 2,500. Yeah, that's feet. bigger than I thought it was. Yeah. So then if you, I mean, then in theory, you know, you sort of can take that list and we can resort the, the list by improve square footage like you know square footage size yeah like so we can have a couple of very variations what we're going to do is this is going to be saved out to the drive as um pdfs anyway like we're not looking to try to you know excel is not always accessible for everybody so pdfs usually are so we'll have a couple of different versions of this meaning one sorted by year the other one will be sorted by size that's yeah. Oh yeah, that'd be helpful. And, and I'll ask uh, Caitlin and Sarah offline if you think that we should go further than 1950 as a stopping point because there could be some relevancy from a historic preservation standpoint. I probably wouldn't bother. Okay, all right, that's fine. Um, I mean, we're, I'm sad to say that now you could be born in a year before me and you meet the requirements for looking at historic significance because you're over 50. <laughs> so. That's what you do for cars. <laughs> I know. <laughs> exactly. Um, so we'll provide this. Um, the um, we have facilities, projects, and estimated costs. That's other town, town, other, other town facilities, pro projects, and estimated costs. We will, um, I'm sorry, I'm being like ridiculous with wanting to make sure these are all the same size. Um, we're gonna make, we're, oh. That's like staff. That would be staff costs, I would believe. I'm gonna say staff and, staff and materials, yeah. like equipment, staff, equipment and materials. We can gather that up. I mean, some stuff is hard to quantify, like, just, like, to pick an example, I mean, if it was rehabbed into some kind of conditioned space that's occupied throughout the year, um, well, we don't, I mean, one can certainly f figure out, you know, architects and such can figure out what are the operating costs for, you know, heating and cooling and all of that. Right. So, you know, in a perfect world, yeah, you would have that, you would have some kind of ballpark figures for stuff like that. Right, I'm gonna say, I think what Tim's gonna be providing is a, here are the staff and the hourly rates, and this is what the time, like, if, if it's three hours a week, if it's once a day, if it's once a week, if it's once a month, if it's once every season, these are the general costs based on this many people, this much equipment being used, like, those are gonna be, like, sort of, just ballpark figures that give some sense of like impact or scale from an operation standpoint. I think the other thing that we could look at, Tim, is to say at what, where's the tipping point for when you need more people than what we have currently. Right. So that's the other thing that I think we have to talk about is like new staff is needed, new staff is not needed mm -hmm. type of a thing. Um, and, and so, they, and they would go under like the long-term operation costs. I would add that into, you know, anytime you add a new staff, that's X amount of dollars yearly, right. no matter what, just to take care of that. Yeah. So I think 
what we could do too is, um, oh, you know what? That's making me think of something. So in the operation and maintenance uh, line where we talk about the operation and maintenance, um, we might tweak this to higher percentages because like at the high operational cost, would we, at the, where, at what point do we need to add a new person? Correct. So that might be, like, we might, as long-term operation cost, mm -hmm. we might also have a staffing mm -hmm. demand, like staffing change. And that just adds into the spider web of going down to the town maintenance demand. Is it, depending on the structure, is it a year-round structure, you're gonna need somebody there once a, once a day, once a week if it's an open air shelter type deal. So it's like a sliding scale almost. On so actually in this place, what we can indicate is where we might add as part of the rubric here, daily ongoing maintenance, like here weekly maintenance, mm -hmm. one new staff member might be required because right. we don't have enough, like we're at our tipping point right now. Yep. If it's daily ongoing maintenance required, maybe is that two or more are needed? Like, so we can add that staffing change mm -hmm capture that and you know maybe number three is there's a part-time mm -hmm. staff addition required and then you know four and five if we can just absorb it into yes our normal. yep yeah so we can we can look at that as a um i'm gonna just say add staffing so i'm not gonna i don't want to like have you guys watch me make edits to this that doesn't make any sense it's not a good use of our time so we're just making notes so that we can capture sort of what we're gonna do in the sort of the new and improved version for everyone. So going back to um, So planning level cost some as estimates for construction. I think planning level for um, building operation and maintenance. And I think we have other, you know, other buildings that we sort of can borrow from mm -hmm. as like, if we're gonna be looking at this as a fully occupied building, we look at yes. Dolomite and say, yep. this is what it costs us annually to, to operate yep, that's Dolomite. An easy, yeah, that's yeah. an easy transition, I think. Yeah, yeah. If it's something in between, like less than that, and we can find something comparable, mm -hmm. and then so on and so yep. forth. So we'll be able to give you some points of reference, I think, for that. Other information that we think we need Is the Shadow Pines master plan on the town website? Or? It is. Okay. It is. Oh, I'll put it into the Google Drive as well, just so it's easy for people to find. And then we are gonna, we'll have the individual sheets or pages out that just get zero into the information that might be relevant for this committee to look at, like it is or is not in keeping with. Anything else? Oh. Estimated demolition costs. So I would do that, that in construction. Falls under construction. That would fall under construction, okay. so we can have a ballpark for that as well. I'm not sure if we could borrow numbers also for town revenue source. If we would have any examples we could. Yeah, that's, um, I, I, I think we have to figure out like, how do we estimate town res revenue? Like so town, right. Town, I think it's, we want to try to revenue estimates i think we can i think they could be very generic we can just see what the town makes off of dolmite lodge that type of deal mm. yeah and then use that as a baseline to say that's like the minimum that's not including if we're doing summer camps holding summer camps there or anything else renting out fields near there or anything like that so right it could be a good baseline for the um right whatever we're making off of the lodges yeah um that might be a good sort I don't of know how to word it, but. but yeah, yeah, no, no. I think if we do ten, I'm gonna based on existing town uh, programming. Could we go through because the Shadow Pines Master Plan essentially says like you know we can have these types of land uses and structures that are promoted. Can we? Um, basically create a list of all the, I mean, we have a list of what basically 
the barn could be used because that's one thing we don't really mention explicitly in the alternatives that like we are you know going to oh. rehab this as so, a you know um, uh, for one specific use but what if we looked at all the uses and said like if it was used for this it would generate this much revenue it would generate no revenue um, I'm thinking that's the only way where we can really look at like any of the specific uses and create you know tangible um, revenue because um, if we only look at you know the Dolomite Lodge and say like okay that generates this much revenue whereas you know there were other uses proposed in the um, in the master plan such as like the, the ski rental and things like that that aren't necessarily tangible just by looking at the numbers from Dolomite um, so I'm thinking that's one thing we could do is look at those proposed improvements or land uses from that plan and potentially grab numbers that would be associated with that type of use. You know what, I think what we might want to do is let's let's continue that conversation and come to the next meeting with more information sure. around that so yeah. we can decide. Because I think the other challenge is the, you know, the committee could certainly provide input or like thoughts about, oh, we think this would be a viable use or, but ultimately if the recreation department was like, oh, actually we're not trying to do that sure. right now, sure. that could be a problem. Right. Like if we're, creating, envisioning some scenario that is not either feasible, not part of their five, you know, their master planning effort. Um, I would also want to have Andrew in the room, sure. Andrew Erkfitz, our recreation director, in the room when we're having those conversations, because ultimately those things would, he'd be the one going to the town board saying, yes, we can do this, no, we can't, or the town board be, be telling him, we need you to do this, or we don't want you to do this. Like, so. I think it's worth having that conversation. I don't think we're ready to have it right now. Sure. That makes sense. But I think it's something we put on the agenda for next meeting. Um, so information needed, town revenue estimates better. And then I think we can say sort of refined menu of potential uses for a few, not all, but a few of the alternatives, because right. not all the alternatives involve the town doing something right. with the, the property. Um, for uh, okay, anything else? that we might need to gather or collect. And if anybody thinks of anything like between now and another meeting, or you know, you go out of the room tonight and you're like, oh God, wait a minute, just send an email. I would say also from a housekeeping standpoint, unless you really feel like the whole committee needs to see it, I wanna be mindful of everybody's inbox. And when we have reply all communication, that can get overwhelming quickly. So, um, I don't know what everybody's thoughts are about that. Do you guys, would you prefer the reply all and have it be everybody copied in? If you don't mind, I don't mind. I'm just trying to be sensitive to people's inbox. And I'm really looking at my resident because staff get inundated with emails on a regular, so we don't have a say in that, but I wanna be mindful of our citizen representatives and our, um, our subject matter experts. Reply all, is that like the end of like, oh my God, stop with the reply all. I don't think it's a problem unless it like, you know, gets a huge number or something. We okay. can deal with it. We, okay. We, we get spam if that all the time also, so. You all right, so if that, yeah. So I think there are gonna be a couple of things that we do anyway by email. So, a, you know, a giant group email is gonna be required over time, but I just wanna maybe have that conversation so we're being mindful of people's preferences. So one thing that certainly would be helpful for me is when some of these things you're gonna put into this um, the Google cloud. Drive. The Google Drive. So I'll always also attach it. Okay, so I mean, just saying it's there now or something so like this. So I will I send the there. email that says the, up, the Google Drive has been updated with the following attached items. Okay, great. So it'll be attached as well because not everybody loves going into a Google Drive to go grab stuff. Right. So That's it'll good. always be an attachment. But if you don't want to, you know, inundate your own computer with attachments and save them, then you'll have a, a, a cloud-based place Great. to go see them. All right. And with 15 minutes to spare, 
I think that really does conclude what we were trying to accomplish tonight. Um, I do appreciate everybody's thoughtful input and feedback. Really appre appreciate uh, Sarah and Caitlin being with us tonight. I think you certainly have provided lots of good feedback that we can use in the rubric, and we don't mind that the alternatives list grew. That's the purpose of the meeting. Um, so thank you all. And um, we do have another meeting uh, on the schedule. Um, forgive me for not remembering off the top of my head what that is, um, but I will put it, make sure it's, uh, I'll get it on a calendar request. And we've identified a potential July date as well. I think it's the 17th. I believe you are correct. July 17th. Thank you for saying it out loud. I'm always reluctant to say a, a date and then be wrong. So, um, but yeah, so we'll be going back to a Monday night meeting. And I do apologize. I was hoping we could uh, land on some like regularly occurring night, meaning a Monday, always a Monday, always a went, but that's just not maybe possible. So it is gonna fluctuate from uh, month to month. And then I don't know if we're gonna be able to find a date in August, so we'll have to, remain to be seen. That's a tough month. A lot of people take vacation. Um, I know I'll be away for a week and we're 10 days. Um, certainly the meeting can go on without me, but I would appreciate the opportunity to, to, to be part of the meeting. So we might maybe skip to early September instead. Um, if anybody has no other comments, questions, I think we would call this meeting adjourned. And thank